Look deep, deep into my eyes. You are witnessing a demonstration of the awesome power of the human mind. The unlimited potential of total concentration. My mind is totally focused, able to maintain absolute and utter control. A mind such as this is a powerful force. It could even rule the world. Hey! Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Hey there, everybody. It is P.T. Pop. All four lobes in my brain securely bound behind my back. And thank you for downloading me. Welcome back to another episode of P.T. Pop, A Mind Revolution, where I lead you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. And as I was li- uh, listening to my introduction there, I was thinking to myself, I did learn something in college. Here I've been putting down college for many years. I'm not a big believer in higher education. But I realized I learned a lot about marketing and how to manipulate people by taking a bunch of graphic design classes I've taken over the years. And uh, I guess I'm educated, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, most marketing and advertising companies, they know one thing. They each and every one of us are suckers. And I mean you, people. You're all suckers. They got you all figured out. They know how to push your buttons, how to get you to do whatever they want. When they say dance, you say, yes, master, I'll dance for you. Please just let me please you, master. That's what they do. <laughs> and it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, it's fascinating. It's sad, but it's fascinating how we all just jump to the corporate master, the puppeteer, it's behind the curtain of every single thing we purchase and we buy and we yearn for. Romance, sex, cars, houses, social life, it's all manipulated. So today's episode is episode number two in season number four of PT Papa Mind Revolution. And today's episode is called is a continuation of my analysis of the book by Martin Lindstrom titled Brandwashed, Tricks Companies Use to Manipulate Our Minds and Persuade Us to Buy. We are all being persuaded to buy. And before I get to get get to that, let me tell you about a documentary I released this last May. The documentary is called The Artist, a Documentary. A wild, wild title. I know, I know, I know. Contain yourselves. Contain your excitement over that title. But the artist and documentary is a documentary I wrote, directed, did some of the cinema, cinema the cinematography, and um, I wrote it, directed it, I distributed it, and the film basically it's filmed in the thriving art community of Dayton, Ohio. The artist and documentary explores the life of an artist through conversations with people passionate about what it means to be an artist, the challenges they face in this digital age, and the importance of the support of the art community. And um, that movie is now on YouTube for free. Free, I tell you. Free at last. It's free at last, I tell you. And I'll put a link to it in the comments here. If you're feeling charitable and you like to buy it, it's also for sale on Vimeo. And on my website, if you go to the artist documentary.com, you can read about the film and get some, see some pictures of it, see a trailer, things along those lines. But it's a, I'm very proud of this piece of work. Um, if you know any artists, regardless of what medium they create in, whether it's digital or it's painting or sculpture or whatever it happens to be, you know that their lives are not easy. You know they struggle to make a living. And very few people really do make a living with their art. And I know there's a few people who are like, yeah, I'll make lots of money and I'll make 50 grand a year selling my wood carvings. Yeah, uh-huh. Lots of luck to you, hon. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a rough life. So that's what my movie tries to cover. And I, I visit with a couple of great artists, primarily Logan Rogers. He's the protagonist pretty much in the film. 
along with Rusty Harden, Rodney Veal, and a variety of other very talented and gifted artists. So check that out. I also am a musician. I have songs for sale on uh, iTunes, or what they call it now, Apple Music. I'm an author. I've written three novellas. The most successful one I have is called Press One for Murder, which is neat. They're all books of fiction. And another book called Breathe, John Lennon, A Conspiracy to Murder. I'll put links to each of those in the description here. But hey, so chapter two in this book is what I'm going to cover today. Today. And chapter two is a book, is a chapter that talks about fear. And this chapter is called Peddling Panic and Paranoia, Why Fear Sells. And what I have found in this book is I my jaw just hit the floor when I saw how they use manipulate us with advertising. And in just about every way you can think of, Brandwashed is the name of the book. Brandwashed by Martin Lindstrom, tricks companies use to manipulate our minds and persuade us to use, persuade us to buy. And you're like, well, you know, why why are you telling us about this, Pete? Because I think this is what I think, okay? when I Before I'd ever taken a graphic design class, before I started reading any books about how we're all manipulated and, and you know, kind of hypnotized to buy certain things, to live a certain way. I was just like the rest of you. I had no clue. I didn't know they use colors to manipulate us. I had no clue that they use sound to manipulate us or music. I didn't know about the wording that they use in advertising and how they get it to appeal to certain parts of our brain. I had no clue. I didn't know grocery stores are arranged in a certain way to get us to buy certain things at certain, you know, certain areas of the store. I had no idea. And most of you don't know either. Most of you have no idea. And I'm eventually going to get an expert on here. I'm just, you know, I'm somebody that just finds this stuff fascinating. But what I wanted to do is go over the second chapter. I'm on to chapter two. And this is called Peddling Panic and Paranoia. Why Fear Sells. And if you think about paranoia and fear, we're right in the middle of one of the biggest fear pandemics in the history of the world with the COVID-19 pandemic. And they have raped each and every one of us with this pandemic. It's on the news. Everywhere we go, we're bludgeoned over the head with it. We're hit in the face with it. Everywhere we turn, it's on the news. It's on the radio. It's on the internet. It's on billboards. It's on the sides of cars. People are horrified, living in darkness. They're living in fear. They're afraid to step outside their homes. People, I've been in the middle of this with the rest of you for, what, two years now? I've got my friend's husband died a few months ago, and they put on his death certificate that he died from COVID. But my friend's wife, my friend, who was his wife, told me that he didn't have COVID. He died because he was morbidly obese and he had a heart condition. But they found that he had COVID, so they put it on his death certificate. That is the honest God's truth. That's what my friend told me. And she has no reason to lie to me. That was the truth. It's very sad because she lost a wonderful guy, somebody that she loved and her kids loved a great deal. He's gone, but they used him as a pawn to push, to push their agenda. I've got other friends that claim they've all had COVID, but nobody's really gotten that sick. I had one friend who got COVID and he had some blood clots that they allegedly said were from COVID. They cleared him up, sent him home. Then he went to full cardiac arrest. He went into the hospital. They said he was going to die. And he woke up the next day and said, I want ice cream. He was perfectly fine. Other than losing about 30 pounds, he was perfectly fine. So, I mean, I, I don't really know. I, I know of a guy that played drums on my on a lot of my music. He passed away allegedly from COVID, but I don't know the details behind his death. But I don't know thousands of people. I would say I've met thousands of people in my life, but I currently know a couple hundred people. I don't know anybody that's really been affected by this. My mother, my my wife, I'm sorry, my mother. There's a Freudian slip there, Pete. (laughs) 
Uh, my wife got the third injection or the booster. She's had two injections and now the booster and the booster made her really sick. She was sick for two days laying around just in agony with flu like symptoms, but then it cleared up. So right now we're in the middle of a fear, fear, fear demic, a fear demic is what I call it. And in this chapter, peddling panic and paranoia, he talks about, he, the, the chapter starts off talking about Pandemics that they tried to push in 2006 and in 2009. There was a SARS pandemic and, you know, bird flu. And these were all things from years and years ago. And I remember when they came out, I was like, this is all bullshit. You know, I'm not going to get the bird flu. I'm not going to get SARS. And w- what had happened during these things is that thanks to those old um, global health health scares he says what they've done these these companies that make the antibacterial soaps and hand wipe claws and all those things he said thankfully due to those original pandemics the bird flu and sars today we've welcomed antibacterial hand sanitizers into our lives as cheap everyday utterly essential staple expected to exceed 402 million dollars in profit a mere 5 years from now and that's just the united states Containers of soaps and hand gels now can be found at virtually every airport, hotel, restaurant, public restroom, newspaper, kiosk, grocery store, and kitchen and bathroom sinks across the globe. The terrorist cell of germs, so to speak, he says, has become a global family affair. But it turns out that neither swine flu, I'm sorry, I think I said H1N1, well, swine flu, he says, turns out that neither swine flu nor SARS can be prevented from the use of antibacterial cleansing gels. Both viruses are spread via tiny droplets in the air that are sneezed or coughed by people who are already infected. So what these companies who make these gels, they took advantage of the situation at the time, knowing that people were scared to push their products that really don't do anybody any good. That's what they did, exactly what they did. And it helped sales of Purell. This Purell, the top-selling hand sanitizer, is it, at the time was expected to jump 50%, and Clorox disinfectant-wise, 23%. Their sales have, have, have increased by those percentages since the 2009 panic. These guys made a shitload of money off of our fear. By pushing a product that really couldn't help us at all. Think about that. I mean, back then, I remember hearing about swine flu and bird flu and H1N1 and all this stuff. At the time, I was living in Arizona. I I remember it was one of my first YouTube videos I made where I was mocking the swine flu. And nobody got it. You know, nobody nobody got the the swine flu. Nobody died from it. The numbers are just like astonishingly low how many people died from it back then like 15,000 people worldwide died from one or the other and fear mongering is a tactic that's used by companies like Kellogg's that make cereal and what they'll do is they'll tap into the growing misconception by people of what a healthy diet is and what a healthy immune system is and what the uh, what the author states here is that a healthy immune system was the key to stay staying swine flu free. Kellogg's introduced a new variant of Rice Krispies and Cocoa Krispies loaded with antioxidants and nutrients that help the human body's immune system. All bullshit. They just took advantage of it. They said there's a marketing department that sat down, men and women, in a big room and said, "You know what? What can we do to advance our sales?" During this pandemic, so we can make tons and tons of money, so the CEO and the president can go sit in their yacht in some warm tropical area. And it worked. It's fear mongering. He says here that fear mongering is a tactic used by retailers like Walmart, Kohl's, and Target. Walmart was at work around the clock before Katrina. Hurricane Katrina even hit. They have the stores fully stocked with full pallet positions of water, flashlights, batteries, canned soup, 
and canned meat. Now you might say, oh, that's so nice of them. Oh, so nice of them. But they made a tidy profit in the process. See, they're not looking for your, your well-being. They're not really, they don't care about your well-being. They're not thinking, how can we help these people that are about to get hit by Katrina? They're saying, how can we make billions of dollars off of these poor saps that are dumb enough to live in the path of a hurricane? Fear itself, he states here, raises our adrenaline, creating that primal instinct of fight or flight response. And when, when you unite people against a common enemy, fear also brings humans together. It has a perverse yet delicious binding quality. So when these companies and our government, I'm saying and not just our government, but any government, pushes fear, they're trying to manipulate you with it. Um, there's a variety of things that fear does, but fear is, is, is really is far more potent than our facility for reason. It's a persuader. And you better believe, he states here, that marketers and advertisers know it and aren't afraid to exploit it to its fullest. Now, this is why the marketing world uses scare tactics to sell us everything from antidepressants to condoms, dental floss to laundry detergent, burglar alarms to cell phones, bottled water to pizza, as well as countless other brands and products you'll read about in this chapter. I'm just quoting from his book here. He says, I recall seeing a vintage 1950s ad for lunchbox, lunchbox thermoses that bore the unfor- unforgettable tagline, a fly in the milk may mean a baby in the grave. Can you imagine that? Can you being a mother saying, I, I better get that thermos for my kid's milk or there might be a fly in there. My baby will die and we'll have to bury him. Bury my baby if he gets a fly in the milk. Oh, my God. And I'm sure women, I'm sure women and I'll, if you read the book, he talks about how women are, are prey to fear tactics, fear mongering. But they use fear for your self-image. He says, do most of us go to the gym because we want to be healthy or because we're scared of getting flabby or out of shape? Are we afraid of looking bad to others? Do we bathe, shampoo, and brush and floss our teeth out of reverence for the rules of hygiene? Or are we imagining the feared self? And, And the advertisers prey on our fears to sell products is what I'm saying here. They by activating insecurities that we didn't even know we had, like about the um, he says here, like like about the appearance of our armpits. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I mean, like I rarely have seen any of the women that I've dated their armpits. You know, I, I you know I, I don't have an armpit fetish, but I, I can't remember a woman I've dated. There's one girl I was friends with had really stinky feet. But we were just friends and her feet stung because she wore really cheap vinyl shoes from some terrible uh, punk rock gothic store. But I, I don't remember ever looking at somebody's armpits and going, wow, your armpits are hairy or they're smelly or they're stinky. Dove was subconsciously, Dove, Dove Soap, was subconsciously planning the fear that her armpits might be not only smelly but also hideous. Dove had a campaign to sell. I guess Dove moisturizing, um, antiperspirant deodorant type of stuff. They use they use fear, they use shame, they use a variety of things to get you to think you're you're going to be ugly if you don't have this product. You're not going to be as attractive. The opposite sex won't like you. You won't be as popular. Our partner might leave us. You might be lonely or have no friends if you don't buy this product or don't smell this way or don't look this way. You'll have, you'll be sexually inadequate to the opposite sex or whoever you have to find it appealing. They use fear making you think you'll get cancer if you use a certain product, so you better use this cancer or use this product. They, they use fear of death. They use terrorists. They use global warming these days to, to scare you. They use the sun. They've got you afraid of death, terrorists, global warming. Here, global warming is going to use all the time now. 
the sun. The sun is going to give you skin cancer. It's going to ruin your eyes. Your brain's going to fry. And they talk about these things on a regular basis. According to Gavin and Johnson, or according to Gavin Johnston, a behavioral science-based branding consultant, many brands prey on what anthropologists dub panoramic fear. An overwhelming sense that control has been lost, prompting consumers to scramble to find any kind of comfort they can. I've seen that here with this pandemic. I mean, for some reason, people went nuts and they bought, what, thousands and thousands of rolls of toilet paper and and um, paper towels. I mean, you know, they weren't buying food. They were buying toilet paper. I guess everybody thought they were going to shit themselves when this pandemic hit. He states here, it seems seemingly infinite fears, some planted in our minds by marketers and advertisers, others merely amplified by them. So what they do is they know you've got these fears in your mind. They tap into them and then they amplify them. So you'll go out and buy their products to, to help. You, you want that fear to go away. You want to feel good. And there are so many ways that they're using you and, and manipulating you that I've covered in previous podcasts. And the reason ads that are designed to manipulate us work so well is because they hit us in two powerful places, fear and its close cousin, guilt. And... N- no, and no one is better at spreading that virus than marketers and advertisers, is what he states here. Now, the basic thing here is, in short, fear and guilt are marketers' are marketers one-two punch. They prey upon your fear and your guilt. And the the, the funny thing I see here is that most people out there, most of us, most of you aren't educated in advertising. You're not advertising and marketing. You're not, you're not, I'm sorry, you're not educated in marketing and advertising, and you're not aware of what graphic designers do. Now, graphic designers sit down and they're given a product or they're given a project to complete by, by a client. And the client says, hey, I want you to help me sell paper towels. And they want you to incorporate their logo, but they also want you to come up with logo for the new paper towels that makes people want to buy it. And they use colors. They analyze the colors. They know the psycho- psychology behind the colors. Not the graphic designers necessarily, but the advertiser knows what font they want. Most of the marketing people know what colors they want because they know what, what colors stimulate the mind to make it want to buy. They know what colors make people think it's fresh, that it's clean. And it and it's constantly pushed in our throat. I mean, false impressions are also put out there. You know, I mean, think about think about the television ads and the commercials we see for diapers or for um, paper towels with the plump cheeked airbrush babies who look as though they've never caught a cold had an ear infection, or had a scrape on them. Every advertiser and marketer, every company wants you to believe there's a pill for that. There's Rogaine, there's Vioxx. And, you know, when you see these commercials with an Olympic ice skater skating around who's got knee pain or ankle pain, they want you to think, oh, no, if an Olympic ice skater can come down with arthritis, so can I. But look, thanks to Vioxx, She's skating again. I've fallen for this. Maybe not with the ice skater, but I've seen people on TV, you know, oh, if that person uses this, maybe I could too, you know. If if this famous person, Shaquille O'Neal, is selling something, you know, I, I one of the ones was um, George Foreman and his grill. <clears throat> now, I don't know the story, story behind George Foreman and his grill, but I remember going, i got to get one of these grills, man. George Foreman says it's good. It must be good. And uh, a friend of mine bought one, and it was it was no big deal. Was, the hamburger didn't taste any different than what, you know what you put on the uh, when you cooked in in your kitchen or on a grill. But George Foreman, George Foreman says so. 
you know. But the one thing that I want to talk about today are the pharmaceutical companies because they make trillions of dollars off of us. And he states here, the pharmaceutical companies also play one of the most subtle yet powerful psychological tricks, our fear of social isolation, of being outsiders. Countless studies show that humans have a universal need to belong, dating way back to our early ancestors, for whom survival depended on being a member of a brand or a tribe. For most of us, the thought of being left out or alone is terrifying. Now think about that. Right now we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And everybody in Western civilization is raised to believe there's going to be a knight in shining armor to come galloping down from the mountaintop on a white horse. And our savior is going to be wearing a white fedora, a cowboy hat. And they're going to provide us with safety. They're going to come down and rescue us from the mean, evil COVID-19 virus, right? We're raised that. We're raised to think someone's going to come save us. And in this case, it's the government and the pharmaceutical companies. Don't worry, we'll provide you with a vaccine. They're going to give us a vaccine and it's going to save us because most people that I know and that I've talked to, the worst part of this virus is that they're alone. They can't see their families, they can't see their grandkids, they can't see their kids. Older people can't see their their young kids. Everyone's afraid of getting grandpa or grandma sick. I've seen it in my own family. Everyone's afraid of getting somebody sick. We're isolated, but then once we're isolated, we're doing a good thing. We're doing the right thing by staying isolated, but everyone's miserable. I mean, the suicide rate is through the roof in this country. Do you think the pharmaceutical companies are making the vaccine care? Do you think they made it to help Quelch, squelch the suicide rate or the loneliness or the feelings of abandonment? No, <laughs> no, they didn't. They didn't. They made it. Cause they, they're making this vaccine because they're making billions and billions and billions of dollars off of it. Now he gives an example here. He says um, they give. They begin with the solitary shots of our worst feared self. A balding man, an overweight woman, or an unhappy or distracted child whose gaze is conspicuously averted. Once the person in the ads has taken whatever it is that is designed to improve their appearance, steady their mood, or alleviate their symptoms, not only do they look brighter, happier, and sexier, but they face straight ahead and look into the camera. And he's not referring to viruses here like I was talking about with, with the pandemic. He's talking about these, you know, these commercials where a company's selling a pill for arthritis or for, um, you know, Viagra, like for erectile dysfunction. This is on TV all the time. Erectile dysfunction. You know, have got this couple, a middle-aged couple or older, and they're sitting on the couch looking kind of solemn. And, uh, you know, do you have trouble getting an erection? You know, the announcer says, well, thanks to Viagra, you can get it up again. Yes, kids. And you see the next shot after the guy takes the pill. He's happy. They're smiling. Yes. I, you know what? I, I want to meet these women who are really depressed that their husband can't get it up anymore. Because <clears throat> most women I know, <laughs> they're like, honey, and could you just put it back in your pants, please? I really don't want to see it again. You know. But they, they make it look like once you take this pill, you're going to have a better life. You're going to be happier, friendlier. Your friends are going to like you, not because you got a boner, but wh- whatever it happens to be, whatever ailment it happens to be fixing. And pharmaceutical companies spend millions of dollars a year stirring up fear in our hearts over conditions we never even knew to be afraid of. <laughs> And it found that Big Pharma spends nearly twice as much money on promotion and advertising as it does on research and development. Let me say that again. Big Pharma spends nearly twice as much on promotion and advertising as it does on research and development. That's because they want you to buy their product, not because they care about your well-being. They want to make money off of it. 
Now I could pick on a certain pharmaceutical company, but I haven't done that research, but we we could find out how much these CEOs and presidents and people that run these companies make and how much they make off of your alleged illnesses that they're supposedly getting rid of or medicating or putting off. Mr. Lindstrom states that Americans are the most over-medicated people on earth with overall domestic sales of prescription drugs, drugs totaling $235.4 billion. And this book was released in 2011. So this book is over 10 years old. I bet you it's twice that. And I bet you we spend over $400 billion. Let, Let's look it up. Let's look it up, shall we? How much do Americans spend on prescriptions? I put it in DuckDuckGo. This is the prescription drug spending from Statista. Well, I'm off by I'm off by a hundred million. It says in 2020, Americans spent 358.7 billion dollars. On prescription drugs. That's 150 billion higher than 2011. The point is that the illusion of cleanliness or freshness is a subtle but powerful persuader. If, if they think, if you think you look good, if the if they can convince you that you smell good, if they convince you that you're walking better because you're taking a medication. They're making you think you're going to be more successful. You won't be isolated. You'll have friends. You'll be sexier. You'll be getting it on with, with the ladies or the men. You know, you'll, you'll have all this. Your life will be improved. And I'm just, you know, I'm perplexed by it because I, I just, you know, I I made this podcast because I want people to know that, number one, the companies don't care about you. They do not care about you at all. Number two, they want to make money off of you. And number three, they're exploiting you so they can make money off of you. Okay. That's, that's the simple truth, but most people are blind to it. And most people that might have a hint or an idea that's, that that's going and they to put blinders and they don't want to know. They just want to know that they're their beer is numbing them, that their cigarettes are calming them, that their, you know, their uh, excedrin is taking away their back pain. And I think more knowledge of this will give people more power if you want to have more power. Now, most people don't want to have any power. Most people are just like, well, whatever, whatever, I'll smoke the cigarettes I want because I'm a man. I drive a Ford F-150 because they told me that's what I got to drive to be like John Wayne and be tough. I got a six shooter in this side saddle and uh, I got a Hemi under the hood and I'm a tough guy. <coughs> you know, and that's the way we're raised. So whether it's, as Mr. Lindstrom states here, so whether it's germs or disease or some feared version of a future self, marketers are amazingly adept at identifying fear out of the zeitgeist, activating it, amplifying it, and preying on it in ways that hit us at the deepest subconscious level. You see, the whole point to this is that that these companies have brilliant staffs of psychologists and marketers and advertisers that know how to fuck with you. They know how to say, hey, that old guy over there that can't get hard anymore, let's tell him he's depressed. Let's tell him his wife doesn't want him anymore because he can't get a boner. And this pale Viagra is going to make him and his wife happier. And I, you know, I know somebody that's on Viagra. I'm not. I sometimes wish this monster in my pants would go to sleep. I sometimes wish I'd wake up and it wouldn't bother me anymore in the morning. But I've got, you know, I've got a friend who's on it. And uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I've i dated lots of women. I've been dating since I was 15 years old. I did lots of people before I got married. And I, I don't know, you know. I'm not, um, 
I'm not like hung like a horse, but I'm not, uh, I'm not doing too bad down there. You know what I mean? You know what I mean there, Charlie? And uh, I've never had any complaints, but I never had any. But you know what? I sure wish we had sex more. Hey, how come you're not in the mood anymore, Pete? Uh, Damn, I sure wish I had you inside me right this very moment. There's very few women I've dated are like that. And the ones that were like that, that really wanted it all the time, had some serious, serious mental and emotional issues from the things that stem from their childhood. I'm not making fun of them either. And lots of women that had huge sex drives that had, had been abused as kids. But um, they'll take advantage of everything they can. And, and they're using so many different tactics to, to get at you. And I want what I want to do with this podcast is make you aware that they're using fear, your insecurities, your self-image, your poor self-image to manipulate you, to get you to buy things that you don't need, to get you to want things that aren't good for you, to make you think you're going to have fresher smelling hair because it smells like apples. When apples in shampoo don't mean your hair is cleaner. He, uh, Mr. Lindstrom even cites here shampoo companies that put a chemical formula together to make the shampoo more bubbly. So the consumer would think, I must be getting my hair cleaner because there's more bubbles in it, which makes no sense whatsoever. Bubbles, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Bubbles have nothing to do with cleanliness. If that were the case, I'd bathe in beer. Um, Each and every one of you are being manipulated on on a variety of levels. And I want you to start looking at it. You don't have to do it for me. Do it for yourself. Walk into a grocery store and think, I wonder why all these candies are at the checkout aisle. It's called impulse buys. They put all the M&Ms and the Milky Way bars and the gummy bears in the long checkout lines uh, of any store. It doesn't matter. Even at my local hardware store, there's a bunch of shit up at the, at the checkout, like little little candies and little um, flashlights and headlamps and lighters and stuff they're like as you're standing there like i i don't want any of this shit but there must be somebody that goes you know what i could use i could really use a lighter to shape like a fire hydrant yeah hey hey sally give me that that lighter there the shape like a fire hydrant the green you know give me the green one because people are weak and they they don't know they don't know they don't really need it but then whoever comes up with this crap has has analyzed their minds analyzed their behaviors both men and women and decided and employed tactics to get you to do things you don't necessarily need or want or have to do. And if you can become aware of this and say, who's doing this? What effect is it having on me? Why do I want this product? Where do I see it the most? You know, who is doing it? That's what I talk about my other podcast, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. <clears throat> I've never looked at a grocery store the same since I found out that they put the produce in the entryway as a psychological ploy to get us to not feel so bad about buying junk food later on. They put the impulse buys near the checkout at the checkout because you're bored and you're anxious, you want to get out and you you try to give yourself a little dopamine hit by buying yourself a Milky Way bar that you don't need or don't want, but you did it because it feels good. They know that. They've got that all designed. And if you can become more aware of what is happening out there and how you're being treated and how you're being manipulated, you can have control over it. You can say, hey, wait a minute. I don't need this Milky Way bar right now. Not not to pick on Milky Way. I can't stand Milky Way bars. But I don't really need this right now. And you'll find as you as you start to pull away from all the things you thought you needed, you'll want them less. I did that here at home. I used to just be a, a potato chip junkie and candy bar junkie, and we had potato chips, and we took all the potato chips out of the house. We, we have once, once a week, we have a little tiny bag of potato chips to eat with a sandwich. We don't have the big bag of chips anymore. And I found that once I stopped eating chips, I, I wanted them less. And it's like that with most things. When I stopped drinking alcohol, at first, it was hard because, you know, alcohol is one of those things that really messes with your head, regardless of if you're an alcoholic or you just abuse it. And I, I was convinced I needed to have a drink. I was convinced that I needed alcohol to enjoy the rainy days. It was raining outside. Oh, I need a couple of beers to really enhance this rainy day. 
And then when there was a snowstorm, I need a couple of beers to really make the snowstorm beautiful. And when I was cutting the grass, I said, you know, the, the smell of this cut grass while I'm walking behind this lawnmower and sweating to death would be a lot better if I had a beer. And then I stopped drinking and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to enjoy this rainy day without a beer. Or I'm not going to be able to enjoy Christmas without a couple of glasses of wine. And then what I found out was that wasn't true. And the further I walked away from the booze, and I wasn't a big boozer, but but I abused it pretty good. I I didn't need it anymore. Rainy days are gorgeous to me now. I, I can look at a rainy day. I love rainy days, but I certainly don't need a beer to to enjoy it. I don't need a beer to enjoy snow or fall or autumn or winter or spring. I um and that's they they don't want you to know that that if you put this stuff down that you don't need that they've they've they're peddling panic and paranoia. They're playing on your fears. They're playing on your insecurities. They're playing upon everything because fear sells. Paranoia sells. Right now, we're in the greatest fear pandemic. We're in the greatest fear fear demic and paranoia demic in the history of mankind. They got everybody horrified. We're horrified of each other. We're horrified of the government. We're horrified of the military and the police. They got us hitting the police. And everyone's hunkered down in their houses with their guns and their vaccines and their face masks. And they're going to, but they don't even know who the enemy is. We think it's a virus, but, but the enemy is really the corporations that run the countries, that run the world. Think about it. The next time you go into a store, think about the colors that you see on the shelves. You see a lot of reds. Think about the music that's playing overhead. Think about the way things are laid out. It's all designed to corral you like cattle through the store, to get you to buy, to get you hungry, to get you anxious. Because anxious makes you want to, you know, when you're anxious, you don't want to be anxious anymore. So you buy things that give you a dopamine hit that will calm you down and take the anxiety away. And you want to be calm. It's all designed. You're being manipulated every turn, around every corner, everywhere you go in this country. I can't speak for France or Italy or the Philippines, but here in this country, there are billboards and messages and advertisements everywhere you look. It's on everybody's shirts, it's on everybody's shoes, it's in every grocery store, it's on the back of cars, it's on the side of cars, it's on billboards, it's on TV, on the internet, on the radio. You're constantly being told what to do, what to think, what to think, how to feel, what to be afraid of, how to be afraid of, how to conquer that fear. So I just want to talk about that. Check out this book. This is an awesome book, Brand Washed, and it's for sale on Amazon. And it's by Martin Lindstrom. You can buy it on Kindle, audiobook, hardcover, paperback. This is not a paid promotion by Mark Lind- Martin Lindstrom. He doesn't know me at all. And he may or may not care whether I'm pushing his book. But he talks about some of the things that you all need to be aware of. I'm P.T. Pop on a mind revolution. Leading you out of the rabbit hole one grain of truth at a time. Hope you all have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye. Swallowing me, like a dog in a cage, how do I to be free? Drinking wine, wine, save by the bell in the middle of the night, just in the name.